Amen. I want to read the text for today. It's in Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission. Maybe you've heard this before. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, some worshipped him, but then some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Everybody say go. Go Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is unchanging, it is sacred, it is the truth that we build our life upon. God, I pray that as we open it today and as we study it, um, God, that you would use me, that you would use a broken person like me to proclaim the good news of the gospel, God. God, you hold all power, you hold all authority, And you have left us with a task to go and make disciples. And so, God, I pray that we can take what seems like just something that is just repeated over and over and that we can actually take hold of it and run towards where you're calling us. God, be with us today. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Turn around, act like you like a few people. Say hello and find your seat. Awesome. Good morning, good morning. I'm excited to get in the Word today. I know some of you are really tired and sore from yesterday calling the hogs. Anybody have a good time yesterday? Woo pig. Um, it's, it's my first uh, weekend in uh, the promised land when there's a home game. So uh, it was, you could just feel, feel it in the air yesterday. I stayed as far away from the traffic on that side of town as possible. And, and uh, man, it, it's so good to be with you this morning. Before we get into it, I want to give you a few reminders. Um, we've learned that if we do some announcements on the front end, you actually listen to them. Um, so I'm going to try to take that approach today. Uh, coming up, uh, actually in the, in the foyer when you walked in, there's a table. Um, if you walk out to the left, there's a little table. Um, there's a sign up for our coffee team. Um, who enjoys coffee in here? I know some of you are drinking it as I'm saying it. Um, I've had a lot of people ask, what's the easiest way to get involved right off the bat? And I would say join our welcome team or the coffee team. Um, and we would love uh, some assistance with that. And so if you're interested in getting involved, you can sign up there. Um, second thing is next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday. Uh, We have Connect class. Uh, We have had two different sessions of Connect since we moved to Fayetteville, and uh, this will be our third one that we're doing. And we've averaged around 25 people at those classes, and I think we had like 65 or 70 people sign up at Life Group Launch, uh, which is really exciting. And Connect class is where people learn about the heart of our church and uh, who we are, where we're going. So if you are interested in being a part of that, it's going to be an awesome group. We're going to feed you guys dinner. Somebody say Amen. Uh, if you've been through Connect, don't come back, okay, for dinner. Uh, but this is, our, this is the way that we encourage you to join the church, uh, find out who we are. And we, we split it into two Sunday nights uh, where we learn about you and then you, you learn about us and, and the heart of our church. And so that's coming up next Sunday. It'll be 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then uh, the last thing before we get into it is on Tuesday, September 13th, I'll give some more details at the end of service, we have a interest meeting if you are interested in foster care. Um, as a church, we are about to start really rallying behind this um, in a lot of different ways. This is just our foot in the door. Um, so if you are interested, you have questions, um, coming to the interest meeting doesn't like mean that you have to do anything. Um, it's just educating you about opportunities in this region and how you can make a difference. I want to invite you to that. September 13th on Tuesday night, uh, we'll host a meeting here, and we'll be doing those very often. Um, so over the last few weeks... We've covered a variety of things. We've talked a lot of vision, uh, where we're headed, where we're going this fall, and 
Um, you know, we talked about uh, being led by the Spirit, being hungry to grow, being battle ready, and being committed to community. And uh, some of you came to morning prayer that, the, this last week, and we had a great time pressing into the things of God. And we had Life Group launch last Sunday. Did y'all enjoy Life Group launch? Um, and that was fun. I had a good time, met a lot of new people. And then Wednesday night, we had worship night right here. And uh, man, it was awesome. We, we really enjoyed uh, our time together. Together. And at Life Group Launch, we answered the question, why community, right? And my simple answer was because God said so, right? And I, I told you about my son that asked why about everything in life, and, um, and it's so, so good. Um, God's master plan, what you need to know today, it involves you being connected. It involves you growing and being led by His Spirit, growing together and sharpening uh, each other. Next week, I've got a friend of mine that's going to be coming in and kind of kicking off the whole early church um, direction uh, this fall. And he's going to be talking about um, Acts chapter 2. I believe he's going to go into chapter 1 a little bit. Uh, but it's going to be really good. And this is what we're believing for uh, collectively as a church is that we would all come to know God, that we would walk in the freedom that he offers, and that we would discover our gifts and our purpose in this life. Um, and then ultimately that we would go and make a difference in our community because God wants us to be connected. He wants us to be growing and he wants us to be maturing. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you mature? Now I want you to ask yourself, okay? I want to ask you, are you mature? You can answer. I want you to answer back to me. Are you mature? Some of y'all are like, no, <laughs> not today, okay? Um, and my follow-up question would be, are you mature compared to what? Or are you mature compared to who? I think the better question to ask this, this morning is, are you maturing? Are you in process of maturing and, and becoming who God has called you to be? In, in the family of the church, maturity comes through walking with Jesus, finding freedom in Jesus, and fulfilling the mission that Jesus has set out for us. And so what we're reading today, the Great Commission, Jesus, uh, we're about to see the early church in the beginning of Acts. Jesus is leaving the disciples with some parting words. And uh, he, he empowers them with a mission. And here's the thing. I want you to think about this. If you're sitting with somebody that you really love, and they're about to share their last words with you before they leave, you're probably going to press in. You're probably going to lean a little bit closer you're going you're gonna to have some questions. You're going to have your ears open, your eyes open. The disciples at this point were hanging on to every word that Jesus had to say. And, and, and I want that to be our look and our approach today. As we talk about the Great Commission, here's the reality. Sometimes, especially if you were raised in church or maybe you've been around church a lot, you can hear things like this and kind of br let it breeze over. But this is everything. <laughs> don't, are you all tracking with me? This is everything. Like, don't miss this today. Because this is like the last thing Jesus is telling his disciples, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, verse 18, it says, Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make believers. No. Go and make converts. No. Go and make Christians. No. What does he say? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything, it's an important word to know there, that I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Go make disciples, baptize them, teach them everything I've told you that I've commanded of you, and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Go make disciples. Uh, do you ever sit back, does anybody ever think about the glory days? Anybody ever think about like just, you, and here's the thing is like we call them glory days, but they weren't very glorious. Anybody like, what do you think about it? Um, I want to show you all a picture of my glory, glory days. This is me as a senior in high school. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, I got a pink necklace on. And yes, that is a puka shell bracelet that I wore as an anklet, okay? Uh, I still have that somewhere uh, if Kendra will let me wear it, okay? I don't know. I got like the three-quarter button up, you know, I don't know. And the serious look. You know, it's like, what, is, what am I doing? And then I think I edited the photo to make my tan really pop. You know, I don't, I don't know what's going on. This is the glory days, right? This is senior, junior year of high school. And if I could go back, I would change some things. I want to ask you this question today, and I really want to know your answer. Y'all could, yeah, thank you for taking that down. Um, 
people taking pictures, all right? I want to ask you a question, and I really want to know the answer today, okay? So I want you to message me sometime this week, message our church account, and if you could go back and undo one thing in your life, if you can undo one thing and you could redo one thing, meaning undo, it never happened, okay? And then redo, meaning you had such a good time doing whatever it was that you would do it again. All right, I want to, and if you've got life groups meeting this week, I would love for y'all to talk about this with each other. If you could undo one thing and you could redo one thing, meaning you control, alt, and delete something, okay? Like erase it. Mine would be senior year of high school. I had a red F-150. It was a 1994 short bed, 302. It had a, man, that thing, V8, got no miles to the gallon, and uh, had the big Flowmaster dump exhaust. It was loud, and uh, I, I used to put in uh, speakers and CD players as a little side hustle. It had the subwoofers. I had the little pop-out Pioneer screen. I thought I was hot stuff, okay? Really, this was a $1,000 truck that I dumped a bunch of money into. And, uh, and anyways, I, I would drive around the school with my music as loud as I could get it, right? And now that I look back to it, I'm like, what was I doing? Did anybody else do this? So some of you are like, I still do this. Okay, we're going to talk about that today. Um, <laughs> needless to say, I needed to mature. I needed to grow up a little bit. I was having the time of my life, but, but could you imagine if I never grew out of that phase? Could you imagine your pastor with the, with the, the puka shell, you know, like... <laughs> Can, can, imagine if I never grew out of that phase, and this is the thing I want to I pose to you today, is some people don't. Some people don't. Some people repeat year one and year two over and over again in, in their faith. They just repeat it, and the reality is we, we have to mature, and, and I want to unpack the Great Commission and the idea of discipleship a little bit today. And this is what I've learned about maturity is that mature people know where to go to get what they need when they need it. It could be rest. Like it, you, you realize I need rest, you know where to go to get rest. You, you need to have a conversation. You know how to seek counsel. It, it could be you, you have a decision coming up and you, you know that you need to make wise choices. And people lacking maturity, this is what I've realized, and this is all from personal experience. We, we don't know how to set boundaries. We don't know how to seek good counsel. We don't make wise choices. We, we don't have a steady responsibility in our lives. There's no accountability. There's no true growth, and there's no good fruit. And so I want to tell you today, and it's, it's kind of more of a, a tense topic today, but I, I want to teach a little bit. Are you maturing? Are you growing in the things of God? Because when you are maturing, you have a good source to draw from. You have a good place, a healthy place to go to get what you need. And my heart as a pastor and as a father is, is that this congregation and, my, and ultimately like my kids, my two kids, that we would grow closer to the things of God together, collectively as a family. So question, what is your primary source? Where do you draw from? Seems like a simple question, right? But I want you to really think about it. Where do you go when you need peace? Where do you go when you need joy? When you, when you, maybe you just need energy. This morning I pray, God, I need some energy, right? Where do you go as a source? Where do you go back to? For Christians, our primary source is Jesus. And we, we have his salvation and, and then through his word and through his spirit. Another way to say this is that we go to Jesus as our primary source and this means that we have become his disciples. We have become a disciple of Jesus, meaning he is my primary source. Now, discipleship can kind of be ambiguous. Like, it, it can be talked about sometimes so much that it's like, what does discipleship mean? Has anybody ever just been like, what, how, what does that actually, like, practically mean, discipleship? Sometimes it can be a little confusing. Dallas Willard, he describes it, discipleship. For modern ears, this is what he says, it is an apprenticeship to Jesus. In the world we live in, have you all ever heard of an internship? An internship is not what I'm talking about, okay? Because that means you, you're a part of something to learn something so that you can go do it and ultimately maybe do it better. We are an apprentice of Jesus for a lifetime. When we put faith in Jesus, we're following him. We become a student and a learner of him. 
So, so what is apprenticeship? It's someone who watches closely and repeats what they've seen and what they've studied. If, if you want to be an electrician, you go find a master what? Electrician. If you want to be a plumber, you go find a master plumber. If you want to be a great cook, you don't come to me, okay? Like that, it, that's not where you're going to go to live. You would go to a chef that knows how to cook and prepare a meal. I have become a master at searching things on YouTube. Okay, anybody else? Like the world we live in is kind of cool because like if you have a question, you can t- go to YouTube, go to Google, type it in. How do you, and then fill in the blank. Does anybody else do this, right? What temperature does the chicken need to be for it to be done? You know, what, what, it's like the, it never changes, but I always go back and ask the same question. And so, just me, anybody else do that, right? I've become a master at searching things on YouTube, but here's the thing is I love to learn new things. I love to grow, and, and I, I, love, I got into carpentry many years ago, 10 years ago, and I definitely didn't master it, but I, I learned some things. I got into leather work and still do it to this day. I love it. It's, it's, it's amazing. I love working with leather. But right before we moved to Fayetteville, I, I started studying the art of rebinding books. And some of you are like, Seth, you're a nerd. I know, okay? <laughs> but I, I wanted to know how I can take old Bibles and, and make them new again. And so I started studying this. It was really difficult. And over 100 hours of time that I spent with this little elderly man from New Jersey via the internet, I watched everything he had put out. I watched it over and over and over and over again. I took extensive notes. I would go back to it and learn. I don't want to mess up a step. I I don't want to miss a glue up process. I don't want to miss this, right? Because I was an apprentice under this guy. I learned the art of restoring what was lost and damaged. And and I had to pay, pay close attention because when someone hands you a Bible that they've had for 30 years, and it's got all of their like little notes and things in it. If I mess that up, I'm in big trouble, okay? And so like I'm handling something so valuable for somebody, I need to pay close attention on how to restore it. And I want to tell you, this is the kind of attention that Jesus wants from you. He wants you to go back to his word and, 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 and go back to him in prayer. And when you don't know how to do something, to be able to access him and draw from him. I've always enjoyed learning how to do something and mastering that thing and then moving on to the next thing, but this is what I've learned in walking with Jesus. There is no mastering it on this side of eternity. And if you're here this morning and you think you've mastered walking with Jesus, I just wanna ask you to evaluate your heart a little bit. It's a daily devotion, a daily walk, walking with Jesus. My focus on this side of eternity is to be an apprentice of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, a learner from Jesus. Being an apprentice of Jesus means day by day I do whatever he does to the best of my ability, right? It means that we go to Jesus to learn how to live, to learn how to love, to learn how to mature. Everybody say mature. How to make decisions what our priorities should be, how we set goals for our family, how to think, how to think about different situations. I heard a guy talking recently, and and I'm always trying to become a better parent. I don't think that you just reach a point where you're like the best parent ever, but I want to be a better parent. I want to be a great father. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great follower of Christ. But, um, you know, I was talking with this guy, and this is what he said. He said, you will succeed as a parent, if your kids learn how to think how you think, this is powerful. So often we try to get them to do what we do, but if we change their thinking, we change their doing. I'm going to say it again. You will succeed as a parent if your kids learn how to think how you think. Now, some of you are like, they don't need to think how I think, okay? <laughs> like, just bear with me. So often we try to get them to do what we do, but if we change their thinking, we can change their doing. This is our goal with following Jesus. We want to renew our mind. We want to renew our heart. We want to change the way we think so we can think like Jesus. And the only way we do that is going back to his word and and being in relationship with Jesus. So my plea this morning is very simple, and and it's the the reality that the only path to biblically and, and true spiritual maturity is becoming an active apprentice of Jesus. 
I'm setting you up this, this morning for the rest of the fall, for your life groups, for, for your community groups, your Bible studies, because you need to realize that I have to go to Jesus. He is my source, and, and this, is where, this is where we learn to walk with him. I wrote this down, to, to, to be with him, to become like him, learning to think like him, and then doing what he would do. If we just did this simple approach, I think things would look different. To be with him, to become like him, learning to think like him, and then doing what he would do. So what did Jesus do? He had relationship with the Father. He directed his life to the mission of God. He loved the broken, the lost, and the hurting, and he trained others to do the same. So a question for you this morning, it's kind of a bold question. Are you a disciple or are you just a convert? Have you just put faith in Jesus or have you chose to be a disciple of Jesus? Do you believe or do you, do you just believe or do you follow because of your belief? There's, there's a view of discipleship, and I'm actually, I, I think they're going to throw this up on the screen. This is the modern view of discipleship. It, it's first the convert, then the disciple, and then the workers. This person believes in Jesus and then has a decision to make. Do I want to become a disciple? Do I want to build the kingdom of God? This is a modern view of discipleship, and it is, it's skewed, by the way. It's a little, it's, I'm skeptical of this. And the reason I say that is this was kind of the approach of the rich young ruler. If you, if you read in scripture, he says, what must I do to inherit what? Eternal life. And Jesus said, he, he laid it out for him. He says, sell everything you own and follow after me. What, why did he say that? He, did the one, he told him the one thing he probably wouldn't do. The ruler went away and he was sad. Because the, the rich young ruler just wanted to add something to his life. He didn't want to lay his life down. And so we, we look at the next biblical view of discipleship. If you would throw this up there. This is the biblical view of discipleship. And you see there's, there's one step. It's not make a decision and then pray about becoming a disciple. And then maybe I could go out and make a difference. It's I have become a disciple. This is, this is it. I've become a disciple, a learner of Jesus. This person believes in Jesus, wants to become like Jesus, and is actively seeking to bring others into the kingdom of Jesus. And, and I love this, this, this perspective because this is the woman with the alabaster jar. In Luke 7, she was a prostitute who wore perfume around her neck to attract men to herself. And after having a radical encounter with Jesus, she took what used to draw men to herself and she, what, she broke it at the feet of Jesus so that men would be drawn to him. I want to ask you this morning, are you in the camp of the rich young ruler or are you in the camp of this lady who had a radical conversion and was willing to lay everything she had at the feet of Jesus? It's a very simple approach, but it's sometimes very hard to do. So I want to ask you, what is it that God is asking you to lay at his feet? The first thing I want us to really take note of with the Great Commission this morning is, number one, Jesus is the authority. Jesus is the authority. He starts off the Great Commission. It's really hard to be empowered by somebody if you don't understand what power they hold. Because empowering is the transfer of power. Jesus says, I've got all this power. This is who I am. I have full authority. And then he empowers the disciples to go make disciples. It says, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So who is Jesus? He's our savior. He's our king. He is the authority that we submit our lives to. All authority in heaven and earth, total, universal, all-encompassing, cosmic and earthly authority. I don't even know what some of those words mean, okay? That's a lot of authority, a lot of power. Jesus was pierced and he was crushed. He was wounded, he was oppressed, he was judged. He was afflicted, he was killed by wicked men. And now he's been exalted to the highest place. He's the name above every name. 
He's been given all. Everybody say all. All All authority. It's important you know that before he empowers you to do what he's created you to do. It's important. We can't miss that because we actually live in a region, believe it or not, I talk to people every week, where, where people literally think you can get power from a rock. You can get power from a crystal. From somebody rubbing on your palms and telling you about the future. You can get all kinds of crazy stuff that I can just be around somebody with positive vibes and good energy. And now I can become a better person. I'm not insulting anything. But what I'm telling you is that stuff has no power. Jesus holds all power and authority. And until we fully embrace and realize that it's hard to walk in what he created us to do. He empowers us because he's all powerful. In the world we live in today, many people view authority and influence as currency. If I could just be influential, if I I could just have authority, and and this is how people go about to get that. They're cutthroat, selfish, I'm going to get mine, I'm going to do my own thing. They're, They're willing to trample other people in the process. Jesus shows the way to true power, by the way, which is the complete opposite. Humility sacrifice, love, servitude. He says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He says it is the meek and not the proud who inherit the earth. He says if you want to find your life, then you have to lose it. This is not the, the best way to attract a bunch of people to yourself, right? He says lay your life down and pick up the cross He is the first and the last. He had the first word and he will have the last word. He's the firstborn among all creation. He will judge the living and the dead. He is the sinless son of God. He is the one who has the power to redeem, to forgive every person from every tribe, speaking every tongue, who has ever lived their life. That is the power of God. Jesus has full authority. And he got, he got that by coming in the form of a, of a servant and being crushed for the sin that he didn't even commit. That was our sin, by the way. The sin that we would commit in the future, the sin that we've committed in the past. And finally, this is what Dallas Willard says, finally, for the one who makes sure to walk as close to Jesus as possible, there comes the reliable exercise of a power that is beyond them in dealing with the problems and evils that afflict earthly existence. But don't miss this last part. Jesus is actually looking for people that he can trust with his power. He's looking for people that he can trust with empowering them on this side of eternity to live out the mission that he has called us to. Don't forget this. Jesus is the authority. And he's called us to something greater than ourselves, something greater than yourself. He empowers you to make disciples. Acts 10, it says, verse 38, that we are called to do his work by his power and not our power. I don't know about y'all, but that gives me a lot of confidence. (laughs) Because I don't have to do it in my own strength. I don't have to do it in my own power. That he gives us his power, walking in the spirit of God. The second thing I wrote down is this. Now that we know Jesus has all authority, we know, number two, Jesus has called us to make disciples. Jesus has called us to make disciples. Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So here's, here's a big question for you today. How do we make disciples? Has anybody wondered, like, Man, how do I actually make disciples? How do we invite other people into apprenticeship with Jesus? Is it an in-depth Bible study? Maybe. Is it one-on-one mentorship? Possibly. Is it a book study? Is it leadership development? Is it personal development? Is it Sunday school? All these are great. But what does Jesus want us to see in this, this text? Matthew 4 lays it out. He says, come follow me. This is Jesus talk. Come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once, these guys, they they left their nets, and they followed him. Write this down. I think that I, I got them to put it on the screens. They left their way of life, and they went with him to learn his. I'm going to say it again. They left their way of life, and they went with him to learn his. 
They, they laid it down. The, the, the prostitute, she broke everything she had at the feet of Jesus. She laid it down. The, the rich young ruler, he couldn't let it go. He said, I, I want to follow Jesus, but, but I don't want to lay anything down. I don't know about y'all, but we live in a world where there are people saying, you can do whatever you want. You can have whatever you want. You can be whatever you want to be. And you don't have to change anything, and you can still follow Jesus. Following Jesus means that I have crucified my flesh. I'm laying something down, and I'm picking up the cross. I will never be perfect. (laughs) Y'all looking at a jacked up dude. I'm just telling you. But I am day by day being refined. Day by day. I'm going to come back to Jesus. If I don't know how to do something, I'm going to go to Jesus. If I don't know how to handle a situation with my family, and my, I'm going to Jesus and his word. He has all power. He is, he, he is the authority of my life. And he's called me to make disciples. But how in the world do we make disciples? I follow Jesus. Wouldn't it be a great goal in life to encourage people to leave their own way of live, living? to pursue living like Jesus. If that was your aim, I'm telling you that you'll be a success. The Bible said the disciples left the crowd that was watching Jesus and they joined him up close. Everybody look at me. I wanted today to look a little bit different. I I just think a lot of people really enjoy just being a part of the crowd. It's, It's easy, it's comfortable, When you're in a crowd, you're in a big group of people, it's really hard to get intimate, right? It's really easy to kind of blend in. It's really easy just to maybe be overlooked and I probably won't have to really change anything, but there's something about leaving the crowd and joining really close to Jesus. He starts to see different things about your life, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you approach situations. I, I want to be close to Jesus, and this is what I want. I want a church that every person that you've decided, I'm leaving the crowd, and I'm getting close to Jesus. I'm leaving the crowd, and I'm getting close to Jesus. Jesus had more than just 12 disciples. I want to paint this picture real quick. He was a rabbi. He would, he would walk, and people followed him all over the place. There were hundreds of people, but there were 12 that would get up close to him. He had a small group of guys that would come and they would learn from him. They would walk with him. They weren't perfect. By the end of the story, there was just 11. One of them betrayed him. 12 that followed him closely. There there were also crowds of people that just came and listened and went home. Are y'all tracking with me? There were crowds of people that came and they listened to Jesus talk and then they went on their way. I I don't want to ever be a part of a church that just has a crowd of people that listen and go home. I want you to hear the word of God every single weekend. You find something. How do I need to change? Do I need to apologize to somebody? Do I need to forgive somebody? What do I need to lay down at the foot of the cross? Because I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be a disciple. I want to be an apprentice of Jesus. So the question to follow this up is, have you left the crowd? And have you gotten close to Jesus? Last week, we did the Life Group launch as an opportunity for you to get into a group that's smaller than the crowd, where somebody can know your name, where somebody can hear your story, and somebody can speak to your potential. And we believe as a church, when, when, when your name is known, your story's heard, and and you've got some potential spoken over your life that you can become who God's called you to be. I believe that we have to be in community. And so I wanted to follow up last weekend with our big push towards life groups and the church is growing. It's a, it's a holiday weekend and all y'all came to church. Good job, y'all are way better than the rest of them, you know. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. There's people watching on the recording right now and they're like, that's me, you know. <laughs> I just want us to press into the things of God together. The first Christians, they weren't even called Christians. They were called followers of the way. 
followers of the way. Church, if we want to be mature, we have to follow the way of Jesus. To become a disciple, a learner, an apprentice under Jesus. Where he goes, I go. What he says, I say. When he says stop, I want to stop. When when he says listen, I want to listen. I want to grow and mature. To make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. But teach them what? I want to end the message by telling you, teach them what? Teach them to obey everything I've commanded. This is what Jesus said. Do y'all want to know the commands of Jesus? There's a lot of them, by the way. I'll show you my notes. It just keeps going and going and going. It's the Energizer Bunny. Repent. Follow me. Rejoice. Let your light shine. Honor God's law. Be reconciled. Do not commit adultery. Keep your word. What if we lived in a world where we just did that one? You just keep your word. Whew. Go the second mile with somebody, give the shirt off your back, love your enemies, practice secret disciplines, seek God's kingdom, judge not, do not cast pearls to the pigs, ask, seek, and knock, do unto others as you want done to yourself, choose the narrow way, beware of false prophets, pray for the laborers, be wise as serpents, fear not, why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. Hear hear God's voice, that's a good one. Take my yoke upon you. Be a good parent. (laughs) Deny yourself. Despise not the little ones. Go to the offender. Beware of those who covet. Forgive offenders. Honor marriage. Be a servant. Honor marriage. What if we just got that one right? We didn't try to change it on what God's word and his original intent. What if we just did that? I'm talking about the commands of God in the scripture. Be a house of prayer. Ask in faith, bring in the poor, render to Caesar what is his, pay your taxes. I know it's touchy. (laughs) Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, await my return. Take, eat, and drink. That's a good one. Be born again. Watch and pray, feed my sheep, baptize my disciples, receive God's word, and make disciples. He ends Matthew 28, and he says, Go into the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded of you. And don't worry, because I'm going to be with you. Not me, Jesus. This is from Jesus. Jesus says, I'm going to be with you. I'm leaving you my spirit. So what is a disciple? It's someone who is convinced that Jesus is the only way. He is the only way. He's not, a, he's not an accessory. He's not a caption in your Instagram bio or something you post on Facebook to look cute. Like, no, listen, Jesus is the only way to eternal life. And to come to him, you lay down your life. This is not sexy preaching in 2022. You lay down everything to pick up what he has for you. And then he empowers you with his spirit and then we can go make disciples. That's how the early church starts. And then it just explodes. 3,000 people come to know the Lord. Ooh, we're about to have some fun in church, by the way. People start getting radically saved. We're going to share some stories from Acts that are going to blow your mind. Because God's power is actually power. And what he says he can do, he can actually do. When you start following Jesus, the aim of your life changes. And then Jesus gives them the greatest graduation speech. Have you all ever heard a graduation speech that's just not that good? Like at the end, you leave and you're like, that was not really good. You know, <laughs> He gives the greatest commencement speech at the end. And he says, I, I promise that I'm going to be with you. And you can write down number three, Jesus promises to be with us. If you would go ahead and stand to your feet across the room. Jesus is our authority. He's called us to make disciples and he promises to be with us every step of the way. This is an amazing promise that God seals the deal with. And this is what I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. Like, I want to be known not as someone who does devos and, just reads the word. I want to be someone who practices what I preach. Anybody else? We need some believers 
not just Christians, not someone with a stamp or a title. We need some disciples of Jesus to practice what they preach, practice what they read and study, and go out and do what God called us to do through faith, through repentance, through prayer, through wisdom. Y'all, this is in, we're in the long, this is the long haul. This isn't just something to, like one Sunday, hoorah, next Sunday, it's the same thing. Next Sunday, it's the same thing. And the Sunday after that, it's the same thing. This is the mission of Christ. And so I want to ask you two questions. And my good friend who's coming to preach next weekend, he actually sent me these questions. He, he asked these every single Sunday. It's two questions. He says, God, what are you saying to me? I want you to ask that question. God, what are you saying to me today? And then question number two, what do you want me to do about it? Can we do that today, church? God, what are you saying to me? And what do you want me to do about it? If you would close your eyes across the room, I want to pray for you.